five there. The locker, I don't have any music or anything. I didn't pull any up. Let me just pull up something real quick. Super chill, super, super chill. There we go. <clears throat> super chill out here. <clears throat> and we're going to get going in a few. Once. Uh, we got plenty of people in here. Or as many as we can. Um, yeah. Let me just do my double checks as always. Okay. Should be good, should be good, should be good. Alright. We got a few. There's a couple minutes to see <clears throat> how many people crop in to get started. Uh, you know, if you pop it in, just say hi, let me know you're here, you know. Start chatting, we'll get going in a minute. Once I find my bottle opener. Where'd I put it? It has been nice to front, but shut up, John. Fuck off. Fuck off. Where's my bottle opener? Hey, gangster, what's up? <clears throat> Where is my bottle? Oh, there it is. Haha. <laughs> I got it smart today. I was smart. I ate dinner. Got a full glass of water. Got my normal drink right here. So we're good to go. All right in. See that? You think I see that? You see that? All right in. Nailed that shit. All right. <clears throat> Good to go, good to go. All right, looks like plenty of people are coming in. Perfect, perfect. Perfect. Need an action replay. Yeah, you will hit the slow-mo on that one. We'll save the vibe, we'll hit the slow-mo. Someone clip that shit. Somebody clip that shit, dude. I fucking popped off. I hit my fucking bottle opener into the fucking trash can. Let's go. Somebody clip that. Um, Where's my music playing from? It's right up here. Cool, 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 cool. Jamaican to friend. I don't know how to do it to friend. I guess so. I guess it's Jamaican to friend. Okay. <clears throat> so, I guess let's get started. We got a good amount of people here. It's good. Um, one of the things... So... Ooh, got this. One sec. And then, we'll, then we'll get committed and going. We're good to go, good to go, good to go. Okay. All right. <clears throat> oh, we're losing people. That's one. All right. So let's get started with today. So as you can see <clears throat> in the title, uh, today we're going to be focusing. So <clears throat> if you haven't watched before, uh, usually the way I do things is we start, we have a about an hour long, hour-ish long kind of focused discussion um, where, you know, uh, sometimes I'll bring in like another coach. I've only done one so far. I actually have someone planned um, to come in uh, potentially next week or the week after. Um, next time I'm available to, to do one of these, uh, it is a uh, an analyst for South American contenders, um, which could be kind of an interesting take. It's a little bit different. He's been on the desk um, doing that stuff. For South American contenders, um, and he's co-coach with me on my team that I'm coaching right now. Uh, so I think that could be an interesting insight to a, a region of Overwatch maybe not a lot of people know about, as well as kind of a different side to it. Um, you know, he casts, he's an analyst, so he, he's got a lot of experience doing a lot of different things in the world of competitive Overwatch. So I think that'll be a fun one to do. I just have to plan that time out with him when he's free to do that, and I think that'll be fun. Um, but normally I'll do like an hour long, uh, kind of a focused discussion. And then afterwards I'll review a VOD. Now, normally I'd be review reviewing an outlet VOD. Um, you know, it's outlet channel. I like to review outlet VOD. Um, but since Overwatch League just started, 
Uh, our first week is done and dusted. Um, I wanted to kind of go a little different instead of, you know, analyzing, reviewing, and kind of trying to help people improve their play w- within Outlet. Uh, I wanted to break down kind of a, a, a pro match um, so people could have kind of an idea of what's going on during the high-level games rather than just what's happening in front of them. Um, and the one, there was a, um, a poll, and the one that got chosen uh, for tonight is going to be Philadelphia Fusion versus the Atlanta Reign, uh, one by like live margin. It was like 66% of people wanted to see that one. Um, so we'll be doing that one. Which map I do is kind of up in the air. I'm not 100% sure. Um, but we're going to do that one. Um, I'm not sure which one it'll be. Most likely not Ilios. It'll most likely be, let's see, what did they play? They played Volskaya. They played, oh God, I don't even remember. They played a lot. They played five maps, uh, and we'll be going over one. Oh, they played Dorado. I remember that. Um, I'll be going over one of those maps at minimum one. Let's we'll see how long each takes because a lot of them can take a while. So that's what we're looking forward to in a little bit, about 50 or so minutes, 45 minutes from now. That'll be the fusion versus the rain. And now what we're going to do is we're going to do, you want to see Ilios? I don't want to do Ilios. It's, it's, that was a map that I just don't, I don't even want to look at. Um, and I've done so many control point maps recently and I've touched on Ilios too much, um, in like my personal time. Um, but I wanted to go, so the, the, that's the second half of tonight. The first half, we're going to be doing a discussion, kind of a a base discussion on hero role theory, which is, you're going to see that down there. Um, and that's not, it sounds fucking fancy. It's not fancy. Um, all that we're doing, all that that is, is, is I wanted to do kind of a quick a dive into some theory crafting about how a certain like certain roles that different heroes can fill besides what is expected of them. Like, you know, kind of more in-depth as opposed to, okay, you have the three roles of you have a tank and a DPS and a healer. Those are your roles, but more so in-depth on when you know, high level play is happening and when, you know, high level strats are happening, um, what kind of other roles potentially, uh, heroes could be playing if they have specific goals that they're attempting to accomplish. Um, and this is something that I've covered, uh, on my own before, uh, on my, my Twitch when I was doing my coaching, but I've never covered it here. And I think it's a kind of a cool or an interesting thing to theory craft. Um, like always, if you have any questions, either on what you know I'm putting up on the screen or just in general, um, put them in the chat. I answer all the questions, or at least every single one that I'm able to. Uh, so if you have a question, please feel free to put it in the chat. I'll be more than uh, more than happy to, you know, answer them. Um, but let's first go. Let's go into role theory here. And the way that I want to do this is I actually don't have this pulled up, so I'm actually going to have to do a quick YouTube search, but. What I wanted to cover first at the start is I wanted to cover using what I call, so, so not what I call, but more designating a specific hero slash character to um, isolate and nullify the effectiveness of another. So in the 6v6 match, right, um... The, the, what I want to cover first here in the 6v6, right, that's standard Overwatch, right, I want to cover a concept um, where one of the six will go and his whole job is to isolate um, and minimize the value of another target on the enemy team to make it either a 5v5 uh, that this team is confident in winning or a almost a, uh, a 6v5 where this one is going to isolate this target but positioning himself in such a way that he can still contribute to the five fight. So um, it's like, and more than just, you know, oh, I'm a McCree, so I'm going to flashbang the Tracer every time she comes by me because that's technically doing the same thing, but something much more um, strategic 
a much more planned rather than in-game uh, counters and, and synergies. So what I'm going to pull up here is I'm going to pull up an older map match. I'm going to pull up from the Ichion group stages. Uh, oh, no, I want over. Oh, okay, here we go. From the Ichion group stages. Oh, perfect. It still remembers. Um, the group stages, Canada versus the USA. So I have that pulled up there, um, and I'll keep that ready. So, in, I don't know, Ichion, Incheon, how do you pronounce that? In, Chion. I said Ichion, didn't I? Incheon. Incheon, something like that. I don't know. I'm not Korean. I don't know Korean. I don't pretend to know Korean. Um, so if we're looking here, I'll just pull this up so we can kind of, I always have trouble figuring out the best way to kind of lead into this conversation. Luncheon, yeah. Jolteon, Vaporeon, all those ons. Um, so I, I, I always have trouble um, kind of leading into this uh the conversation, I, I don't really always know how to like show it off um, or, or introduce the concept, but I'm going to here. Um, so what I'm looking at, oh, I'm actually a little too far here. Move back five seconds because these, all right, so everybody's on their, their thing. So the way I want to introduce this to start, I got a couple, couple thoughts, um, is First, we'll look at the way these two teams are kind of um, set up. So, if we're going, like, we're going to roll back the clock, right? Throw a hook in, roll back the clock. This was, this specific group stage uh, in Korea was, you know, pre-Zen Goats dominance. Um, Goats was still very strong, but there was, like, you know, there was still other stuff kind of in there at the time. Um and, you know, the goats, the prominent goats was Ana goats uh, instead of Zen goats. Zen goats wasn't prominent yet. Um, as well as what you'll see here, uh, which was the Sombra. Sombra Doomfist was becoming extremely strong. Hammond had just got released, so teams were kind of messing around with the Hammond uh, as a way to counter goats. Um, so it wasn't as set in stone as when, you know kind of EU and EU contenders and, and stuff like that kind of discovered and abused the power of Zen Goats, which is what we saw coming to the latter half of that World Cup um, from this past year. But if we look at the, the two teams set up here, we have a almost standard on a Goats um, coming out of the fucking nope. An almost standard on a Goats coming out of the, the US team. And then we had something that uh, Canada had been doing all, uh, all group stage, uh, and that's important that Canada had been doing this all group stage, um, and that was running sure for on the Sombra. Now that was in combination with a lot of different things, um, but a lot of what you would see was was this. This was the composition that Canada really liked to run, and it was this variant of Moira goats where instead of the brig. You used the Sombra, and the Sombra's hack was what enabled a lot of the, you know, the damage and the power of the composition. Um, whereas, you know, when you're looking at Zen Goats, right, so again, this is before the evolution of Zen Goats. We're talking about how Zen Goats was good when this, at this time, was that Brig could stun through the Rhine Shield, you could Discord, and you could burn that character down really, really, really quickly. Uh, it's still the case now, but you don't have that... Um, uh, slam through into the shield, right? Which was what made Brig super strong. You could set up uh, stun shatters and a bunch of different stuff. And teams, uh, you know, hadn't really, at least at this level right now, because there wasn't really Overwatch League at the time, um, hadn't put in the effort almost to kind of discover that next level of Zengos. And that was found at the lower level in Contenders and other places in, in EU. And then, you know, Beats when, when Goats actually. Uh, well, no, that, I mean, that was way before because you went Moira, Ana, and then Zen Goats. But regardless, before Zen Goats' power was found, Canada saw this as a good opportunity to kind of put all of their players on some of their strongest heroes. Um, and what you have here 
is, you know, there there is kind of the dilemma, ooh, who do we put on Brig? It doesn't really fucking matter. Um, Agility's played a Brig uh, plenty. But what we're doing here is we're creating a different form of goats, which was precursor almost to what you're seeing nowadays where you're adding the Sombra instead of the Diva, um, where this was the Sombra instead of the Brig. Uh, and Brig is powerful for a lot of different reasons, especially now with her healing buff. But Surefor has a very, very strong uh, and very team-based Sombra. His Sombra play was, you know, outstanding during the World Cup. And that was kind of one of the things coming into that stage where you would see, okay, Surefor has a great Sombra, Agilities has a great Doomfist. Are you going to see that Doomfist-Sombra combo um, more often? Uh, which wasn't necessarily the case. Um, it was a possibility. Whether or not they practiced it, nobody knows. But Surefor has a fantastic Sombra. So... This is kind of what was being played by Canada on tank-heavy goat-centric points, like Library. Uh, or is it called Library? I don't ever remember what this one's called. I always call it Library. University. But I call it Library. Um, so USA knows that Canada wants to run this. Now, if you look back to the Team USA comp. So we've been in Canada, we go back to Team USA, and we look at what they have, they have really standard goats, except they're missing something. Uh, and what they're missing depends on what you're looking at. Um, if you're looking at this at the point of a ground-based goats composition, so Ryan is your main tank, right here, they're subbing Muma in for Zarya. So they're doing Diva, Winston, Reinhardt. And what's weird about this is that this has a lot of synergy, but this is kind of an odd duck out. And then, you know, these guys don't have much synergy. These guys don't have much synergy. A lot of the time, you'd much rather be playing, okay, well, let's put Muma in for the Zarya. And then at that point, you're running standard goats because Sinatra is not going to get a lot of the, uh, you know, a lot of protection that the Sombra was offering, right? Or the Brig was offering. Brig offers a lot of protection to Reinhardt. And, and what's more weird about this is you're putting your Zarya player, who, who you know, the person who would be playing Zarya most in this comp, uh, on Reinhardt, which is weird. You, you almost never see that happening. Um, but having these two main tanks in it is kind of a weird thought. Um, so, you know, watching this, it, it's a very weird composition, right? Um, but... It works really well to counter Canada's composition, or at least how it was used here. And that is with Muma's use of Winston against Surefor Sombra. So it's kind of how I want to introduce it. reminds me of a ranked match, yeah. Except your ranked match doesn't have IQ plays this hard. Unless they do. Then fuck me, dude. Your ranked matches are better than mine. I oh, shit, someone's playing Apex Legends. Bug you. Um, so... Let's go back now. So we looked at that. Let's go back to this. Um, so keep in mind, you have Muma on the Winston. And you have Surefor on the Sombra. And that, that's, that's the key uh, matchup with what we're discussing here. And we're still, don't worry, I know it's kind of long-winded, but we're getting into this, this whole thing on the role theory. So... Kind of the way I looked at this and the way that I do a lot of my coaching, I've said it before on here and I'll say it again, uh, is I take a lot of cues from soccer. Um, it is because I think a lot of uh, a lot of what you can find in soccer in terms of coaching can be applied very directly uh, to Overwatch. Um, you have things like lines, um, you know, uh, leads, back lines, front lines, mid lines, half spaces, um, you know, pressure. Uh, counters, there's a lot of stuff in, in soccer that can be taken and put directly into Overwatch. And one of the things that, that I do is, this is, this is a role theory here, this is where we're getting into it, is the theory of what I call the, <laughs> the lines, yeah, the theory of what I call the destroyer role. Whoopsies. Let's just write that out, destroyer. And what this role is, is it's, it's, you know, a strategy employed by teams. You know, it's not, it's not something that you'll go into a ranked game uh, and go, I'm going to play Winston. He's a destroyer. Not 
what it is. What, what a destroyer is, is it's a strategy employed by a team to use a specific member of your team on a specific hero, in this case, Muma on Winston, to isolate and single out and focus almost solely on the hero of another person on the enemy team, in this case, Sherfor on Sombra, isolate them, take them out of the match, and then minimize any value that they would have within the composition. So, the way this kind of comes from soccer here, as we'll look at this, in soccer, if you look at a standard, so there's 11 players on the field, cut the goalie out, there's 10, because goalie stays the same for whatever system you're in, right? And say we're looking at what's common uh, in soccer called a 4-3-3, where you have three players in the front. These are your attackers, your front line, if you're going Overwatch terms. Um, there's midfielders, right? And, th and this is, you know, not every single soccer or whatever. There's midfielders, your midline, uh, which in this, when, when Dai was prominent, this midline was just D.Va. Because D.Va can go sort of. Sort of. Um, and I'll go into that. But uh, I think you'll you'll see what's going down. Yeah, I think you'll like this. Um, this middle three was D.Va because D.Va in Old Meadows could go forward uh, to protect, help the front line or go backwards to protect the back line, which was these four here, um, which is in soccer, the back line, your defense, all of that, right? Um, so when you look at this, this 4-3-3 this three, uh, four, three, three formation, right? Classically, say you're running into a situation where your team is significantly weaker than the enemy team, or the, the, the other team, your opposite soccer team, and they have a player so vastly superior to any player that you have. And he's basically the linchpin of the enemy team. The other team has one character that, that or one player. I, I'm saying characters like I'm going all video game terms. He's one player that, that is just clearly superior. He's the linchpin. He's who, you know, everything goes through. He is the clutch of their attack. He scores goals, this, that, and the other thing. What teams will often do is they'll employ one of their midfield three in this scenario. Uh, usually this one. Uh, well, actually, not really. Usually eh, one of these three. One of these three will be employed as a destroyer, and they will shadow the enemy player. So if you're facing, right, this is you, your tasks as the destroyer, right? And this is the enemy player, and he's the one you're trying to shut down. Everywhere that the enemy player moves, you follow and, and shadow with him. So what you're doing is you're attempting right, to minimize what kind of impact he can have by shadowing him and focusing your defense solely on him. All right? So what's happening here is that you take out this player from the equation forcing a 10v10 almost situation because this player almost becomes a non-issue and he's forced to work extra hard and the enemy team is forced to either ignore him or utilize his, um, his absence in a positive way, but that's not always easy if you're not playing for this. Um, a very classic example is if you're any soccer fan, or even if you're not a soccer fan, you should know the name. Lionel Messi, lots of teams will attempt to play that role against him to kind of isolate him. And it always happens on, on teams that have a very big name player, is they will put one of their very, very strong and solid defensive players up against them and shadow them. And they'll move all across the field. Now, when it comes to formations in soccer, sticking with your lines are very important. And this is one of the few situations where this, this player, given this specific destroyer role, is kind of free to maneuver wherever he needs to around the field in order to cover his, you know, his, um, his job, which his job basically being that one player on the enemy team. Now, how does this translate to Overwatch? What the destroyer is doing here in this situation, so let's roll back to what we're looking at here, right? Oh, saving this one. I'll put that up here. There we go. So let's roll back to this now. So we're back to this. 
Canada's whole game revolves around Surefour, right? It revolves around him getting the hacks, big EMPs for, you know, big plays. Uh, he is kind of going to be the catalyst on most of their engages. Um, and that's how they had been playing. They had been waiting for Surefour to hit a hack or to cause, you know, a disruption in the back line, force, you know, maybe hydration to go backwards to try to protect the supports. And from there, they would punish off that. So their whole game plan was predicated on Surefour being able to, you know, get hacks off and get value from it, right? And what's going to happen here is Muma is deployed, or at least, now I don't know this, I haven't asked Arrow or Muma, but I feel like this is, this is a solid set play and this is something that would have been practiced. Muma is going to be used in such a way that he is going to deny any available value that their Somber can get. And once their Somber gets zero value and is forced to play differently and with their team, she becomes a non-issue. And from there, because Winston's highly mobile, he's going to be able to join this, you know, one, two, three, four, five versus one, two, three, four, five fight and join it creating a six V5 while Surefour is really not able to get the value. Because if you look at the two characters, specifically in this GOAT-centric matchup, right? GOATS is all about cleave damage. And what cleave damage is, is either, you know, uh, Winston or Reinhardt, where their damage, right? Say there's five enemies here. Their damage goes out and cleaves through everyone. So if you're playing McCree and there are two characters lined up, right? and you're a McCree here, and you shoot them, that doesn't go through this character. This character blocks the damage, so the damage won't hit this character. But if you were playing Reinhardt, and you were this way, right, and you hit your swing across, your swing goes through everyone. That's what it means to cleave your damage through. Same with Winston, right? If Winston was standing here, his Tesla gun goes through everybody. Um, I guess you could consider more his beam cleave, um, her uh, her orb is absolutely cleave. Um, it's just not, as, you know, it's not obviously as good as Winston's or, or, or Ryan's. But cleave damage is your main source of damage in these types of compositions, right? So, sure for he's not going to be doing that much damage. Sombra didn't do a lot of damage back here, back in this meta, back in this patch, right? Her value is coming from those hacks and her EMPs. Now, if she can't do damage, if she can't hack, she can't get health packs. Um, I'm not sure if this was after or before the health pack changes. I think it was after. Regardless, she can't get the hacks off, which is what is this five's trigger. That's what their engage is. Her value is coming from the hacks, right? But this team, if Muma does his job properly, they won't be afraid of this. And then Muma is going to provide more value when fighting in a clumped six than Surfor ever could because his damage is very weak and can be blocked by shields, something that both Muma and Sinatra aren't uh, stopped by, right? Shields don't stop either Muma or Sinatra, but shields will stop Surfor and he already does very little damage. So the alt buildup for Sinatra and Muma is going to be insane, while if Muma does his job properly, Surefour will not get his ult very quickly at all. So let's kind of see how this shakes out. And there's a couple of examples of this, but let's see how this shakes out, right? We'll put it, we'll put it a little up here, right? So this, this is immediate. When you're looking at university, uh, let me, let me go. Actually, I can, I can do, <laughs> look at that. Look at that exit without saving and let's go. Always hit him with that. Bug you. While well, it's loading, I want to check my textures. All right, so we're on university, which is this one? No, that's gardens. This is uh, university. Give me an answer on the back. All right. So if we look on this, Goats is going to fight pretty much in one of two places. Ghost is going to fight either in here or in here, right? Um, there's really no else to fight. This is honestly the best place to fight. Um, it's not open. It's a crunched in space. That's where Ghost is going to get its most value. Um, you know, that's where the Ana can hit anti-nade, strong, and a lot of other stuff like that. And also, if you're on Canada's side, here allows Surefour to 
come around the flank this way and potentially get a side hack off on this or a back hack off on this, depending on where the enemy team is positioned. So for Canada, at the very bare minimum, this makes the most sense to rotate to, to come into this way. USA is expecting goats and their goats, and they know their strongest is here. But most likely, they're expecting a Sombra. So they're going to come in this way. And what you see right away, you saw it right away, is Muma does not go with the rest of his team because he does not need to. What he's going to do is, if you look at this point, this is not a very Sombra-oriented um, point. There's really only two points of ingress that Sombra is going to want to put her, you know, hack a health pack and kind of roam around. You can either go under here, which in the grand scheme of things is pretty not wise because one, it's underground, so you can't get value on the point when you go down there, or up here, which is going to be a much safer spot because you have these two windows, which if you're controlling this high ground, right, you can either force them, you can use this and you can force them up this way to rotate, kind of wasting their time, knowing that your team just wants to fight on the point, or if they come to fight on the point or over here like goats will, your team can rotate around this way and back and allow you to get hack off. Or even if they come this way, rotate through this way so their eyes are facing one way and their backs are facing the other, giving you a free hack through the window. So Surefour wants to keep this space. This is the space Surefour wants to be in. This is where he's going to operate in as Sombra. Because again, this really isn't the best Sombra point. There's not a lot of flank routes that you can go. There's really only this side. Um, which is why I'm really unsure about the Sombra plan here. But notice immediately right away, you're having Muma is going up this way. So he's do all Muma is focused on is making sure that Surefour can't attack this side area, right? So they're coming in, right? And where is, so Surefour's over here. He hacks that health pack, but look where he's going. He's trying to go and rotate. Nikazu, yep, see, he's looking. He was looking right there. Now, I'm not sure why in this specific scenario, Muma wasn't wasting ammo. I'm not sure if he wanted to not get scouted. Um, but in this situation, if I was employing it, I would have had Muma be, you know, on the flank, kind of making sure that that doesn't happen. Um, you know, j just kind of zapping down here on the stairwell, jumping up here, zapping on the stairwell, you know, boom, 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 stuff like that. Not wanting to be scouted against the Sombra. Could have been, but he kind of does a poor job of it. Um, so he gets hacked. Now, right away, value is going to be minimal uh, from the Sombra, and this fight's already over. Uh, Sinatra hits a really good charge onto Banny in the background. Which means that this fight's basically done. Um, it's possible, but it, in all likelihood not. Because if the Sombra's already over here, the hack isn't really um, going to find value. It was. It's not going to be long enough range to get that hack off. Um, it's potential, but if Shorefur had his invis, he could have snuck behind Muma and gone for a hack in the back. Um, and really kind of... Because, like, right here, I'd really want him to be... Like, I don't even know if Sombra's invis. This is just, like, an unfortunate... Because, like, she's not invis when she's shooting. And I, I think I see her hand do the swiping. Like, I'm not sure. Here, actually, let's go real slow. Yeah, she goes invisible right there. Um, Was his... Yeah, does it do... Yeah, because there's that turn, though. Like, it, he's checking for something. He's looking for something. He wouldn't turn unless he was looking for something. He doesn't see it. I think he's expecting um, a hack on to the health pack. Uh, but actually what Sherfor did, which is really smart, is hack this health pack. Which, when they're fighting in this room, means that they don't need the extra healing that a Brig would offer. Um, but it doesn't really work out because Sinatra gets the good. Um, thing. I wouldn't generally say yes, um, but he doesn't need to provide value at this point, and now he's just gonna not do anything because he doesn't need to do anything, and all he's gonna do is just cry. Um, I will be right back.
mouse. I got pissed myself. God damn. Well, I just ordered a new mouse. Looks like a new mouse pad is in the works. And yeah. Okay. Fuck. Hat. Oh, hat's got a little bit of beer in it. That's cool. I don't think I got on that. Definitely didn't get on my wallet. All right. Looking fresh. Looking fresh. Ugh. Jesus. Son of a bitch. Yeah, it adds charm. And a beer smell to my fucking mouse pad. Stay. No, nope, you be good. You stay in my underwear drawer, you bastard. Okay. Now, back at the back of what I was talking about. Hmm? Now, alright, so there are a couple options. Do you name your underwear? No, they're just underwear drawer. Um, so, back to, there's a couple things that I, I kind of want to highlight here. Um, which is why I think this was played really, really poorly. Um, and I think this could have been played a lot better. Um, if it, it's still fucking wet. Um, hold on. I'm going to have to put like, I'm just going to have to dab this shit. Okay. So good. All right. So. I want to highlight a couple things why I think this was done really badly. So, first off, let's look at this. So, this is the engage. Now, there's two, there's another option here, potentially, um, with the way this comp is designed. Now, if it were me, and I was on Team USA, uh, I would thoroughly expect a Sombra coming out of Sure 4 based on what had been working for Canada up until this point. So... I would thoroughly expect it, whether it's in a dive scenario with a Pharah or something, right? But I would expect it. And they had been running this goats with the Sombra a lot. Uh, and they weren't running the standard goats quite as often, if I remember correctly. Now, the other option for what this is, and remember, the standard goats was on a goats at this point. The other option that I can see uh, with this being is that what would happen was that you would, and this, I'm going to agree, this is very sloppy play, um, is that what would happen is, as Team USA comes in this way, the reason they put Sinatra on Reinhardt is because they want to contend with the goats from Canada that's going to also be moving in this way, right? The Reinhardt is vastly necessary to go goats to goats when you're going with Rhine, unless you're going with a with Winston goats, but you need more high ground than what this point's gonna offer. This point will always be a Rhine goats point. It's just what it is, it's the nature of it. Uh, it's how it's built, it's how it works, right? So they know they want the Rhine to contend, but they want a monkey, the monkey, uh, to be played by a more traditional main tank uh, to do his role properly because all Sinatra is really doing is making sure that he can go, you know, in this line here, he can make sure they don't push into them. That's all he's doing. So all he has to do is shield at the proper time and swing at the proper time. He was actually playing a lot of Reinhardt before this match came up. So this is clearly a set play. What I can consider is that as this comes in here, especially with the charge, the charge might have been a set play to have Sinatra charge in and then Muma jump out which there's a lot of stun potential and the reason I don't think that is because if they were expecting full ghost they were expecting a break but what Muma is looking here is a jump in the back line to pincer to go from one angle and then the uh, the team go from the other angle to pincer into a support um, so like an honor which is what they would expect um, so that's kind of the other option I can see with this but the reason I don't think so is, one, again, Canada were using Sombra a lot. It was very common for them at this point in time. Two, um, well, actually, that's just it. Um, two, I think at that point, um, 
you know, Winston's not going to get much value outside of the initial. Uh, and what's going to have to happen is Sinatra would have to switch off later and you're losing alt economy there. So I'm not really 100% sold on that. I think the somber idea is kind of where I'm leaning. And the, the reason I think this is overall sloppy play is if we look at that, this happens. Let's look at like the kind of order of operations, right? So Muma goes that way. Again, he's either setting up the dive or he's trying to prevent the somber hack. Somber hack comes through here in clear view of five other U.S. players, right? And there's nowhere else that Sherfor wants to go. He's either going to be on the point or he's going to be up here, right? And Winston, like Diva, has a great way to scout for Sombras, which is to zap. Um, and so... Um, so he can zap and get the Sombra out of invis here, right? So we see this hack. So U.S. should be saying they have a Sombra, right? So Muma going up here, that's, I believe, why he goes this way to look, or he's seeing what they have to prep for the dive, but he should know a Sombra's coming and he should be doing something. He should be meleeing. He should be zapping, right? Um... He should be doing something, but he he jumps down in an attempt to jump right as he hears the Sinatra charge. So this feels like they're planning to jump in here after the scouting happens, but it's just general sloppy play because I think Muma could have done a lot to not get hacked and then jump in. And again, he, he knows the Sombra's here. He's probably been told, which is why he does that, that little flick to look at the fucking health pack. He wants to see if it's hacked or if it's got, you know, if, if um, the Sombra's coming in. But he doesn't zap. He doesn't waste ammo, which is interesting because he could reload on the jump. Um, can you reload in jumps? Well, he would still have plenty of ammo left. Or even if he just meleeed, right? But he gets hacked. And really the only reason the USA wins this convincingly is because they get to charge on the Banny. Right? But then he can come in and he can, cl he can clock him from the right side. Boink. Yeah, all right. So that goes down here. Bada boom. Here's just a standard fight nano. But if we see... And I don't really know where Moo is jumping from here. So yeah, we're using alls, we're using alls. They're going to win. Easy clappers. Boom, 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 boom. Yep, death, death, death. But see, like, again, they stay Muma. That shows me that this is for the Sombra. Because if if they were going up against this, you know, I would contend something else. Um, nobody goes after him. That was a really good boop. So now Muma's just running in here. There was a certain, there was another point. Once they win the point. Yeah, Muma's going to go up top left, I believe. Yeah, right there. So yeah, all he's doing at this point is he's making it very, very difficult for Surefor to uh, set himself up because what he would love to do here, because this is where Goats likes to hold is up on that close. What Surefor would love to do here is allow his team to move in this way and then move sneakily up this way because what that can do is, is force that um, change in, pers not change in perspective, but um, kind of the two lanes of looking where the front line of USA is going to be looking one way and the back line is going to be concerned about the Sombra. So when you force that there, the hack can come through for free on space. But Moo is just going to sit up top there and it's going to make it hard for Surefor to do that. And the thing is, and this is a much better scenario of if Muma gets hacked, is it worth it? Um, in this case, the answer is yes. Uh, and I think he could have potentially been trying to bait there because of this. If we look at the two teams without who the destroyer is and who the destroyer is attempting to destroy, this comp here is much stronger. Oops. This comp here is much stronger than this comp here. This comp can have its re healing resources depleted and get hit with an anti nade. But this comp has enough damage with the, the Brig, the Rhine, the Diva. 
and has the anti-nade win condition that takes away the value from the Moira and the Lucio. Plus, they have the Lucio on their own to speed in and out. The only thing they're missing is the bubble, which is going to protect XQC. But if they can push that out while giving Sinatra a lot of resources, like a Bionade, you know, a, a fucking armor pack and, and speed and all that, he should survive plenty long. And space can eat the orbs from Crimzo, which is going to be, that's basically most of what uh, Moira's AoE healing is going to be is from that orb. So if he can eat that, he's really minimizing the value that they have. Uh, so that 5v5 gets put in the favor of the USA. So if in this situation, right, Muma goes and controls that high ground on the far left and gets hacked. Hack is, again, the valuable thing for sure for. He's not going to get that, right? He's not going to have that hack to put on space, to put on Sinatra. It's on Muma. So now Muma's useless. But if Muma's useless, they can back up to point and then Muma's able to drop down as needed. Whereas Surefort isn't going to get that same value, right? Because say they back up here, say they keep backing if they wanted to, right? Say Muma was hacked and they keep backing. What they can do is, um, you know, he gets hacked, they can kind of drop down on top of him. Um, and now this is kind of the other thing that Muma's Winston was able to do, and this is what I talked about a little earlier, is that as that fight gets used and all of the resources coming out of Canada get used, then Muma's going to have a free jump into the back line, creating a, a, a pressure, a pincher, uh, which is kind of the twofold of this composition. Uh, he makes it hard for Sombra to get value, uh, as well as make it very difficult for the back line of Canada to really do anything without the Briggs. Done. What's up, FootMob? How you, how you, how you rolling? Is that a good bomb? I feel like that was a bad bomb. That was a bad bomb. So yeah, so now this is just kind of a, a um, what's the word? A descended fight or um, disjointed disjointed fight. Uh, so the same value isn't going to come. But see, that's the value that Surefort brings, right? It's he's able to get that hack onto Sinatra, frees up a free shatter for XQC, and then they get a draft, which I don't think they could got any use out of they probably should have waited sinatra's popping the fuck off dude and the thing with goats is it's forcing these fights to be really extended um so it was going to be very difficult for canada until they unless they committed hard to get any value off of that but surefort didn't have nearly as much freedom as he could have um and muma denied that freedom while having that two-pronged attack from the back uh so that's kind of what a destroyer can do um and that's just kind of what money under 200 for for my spilled beer i didn't spend nearly close to 200 on that beer it's a fucking blue moon just cheap so this is kind of where i first looked and kind of came up with that concept of the destroyer role. Now, one of the next classic examples of this role, um, it's another one that I can go into more in depth uh, with this. So we had that. Does anybody have any questions on this and the destroyer with this, specifically Muma up against that Sombra from Sir 4? There's one more thing I want to cover, and then I'm going to go into the VOD review. I was getting close to that time. I'm good, man. At least you got free money to give me. There's a donate button on my Twitch. If you go to my Twitch, there's a little donate button. You can donate. I'll take that money. I got no problems there. Whatever you want, dog. Um, okay. No questions. If you have them, you know, throw them up. Um, so... Oh, that's my OBS, not uh, my step in there. Okay. So, that's kind of the... Uh, that's... Kind of, shut up, John. Don't call me a sellout. You fuck, you're a sellout. Um, that's kind of... Oh. Thanks for the donation. That's cool. Thanks, man. It's not on mine, but Owlet really appreciates it. So, 
that's kind of the Muma and the Sombra. That's where I first kind of thought about this. Um, and, and it was a really weird point. So it made it kind of hard to analyze, but I hope you guys kind of had the understanding of, of it. Um, so something that I noticed as well after this, I was thinking, okay, how else is this employed, right? Because this, this is, you know, something that could be used to great effect um, within Overwatch. Uh, you know, you have a star player and you could attempt to shut them down. Now, obviously, there's a lot that goes into it. You know, it's not just as easy as like, oh, let's just kill Jonak. Um, you know, there's a lot that goes into it. But I was thinking about how else you could do this. And one of the ways, um, I, I, I'm not going to be able to find it. I would take too long. But let, I'm just going to kind of create a fake point um, from a match that happened ages ago when Tracer was meta, right? I know, it's been so long since we've said those words. Let's go to Nepal. And this is something that one of the greatest examples in Overwatch of a player that whose basically entire style is revolving around being a destroyer. Um, being a destroyer and making it very difficult for the enemy team to find value is Sabio B. He is pretty much what I would call the classic example of someone who is very good at that role. And when Tracer was meta, that was kind of his gambit. So what would happen was, so let's go to this point on Shrine, right? Something that would happen, you know, is with Tracer, a lot of times skirmishes would break out on different parts of the map, right? Because Tracers are always looking for a back line, you know, any kind of ingress to get on supports, any off angle, any way they can kind of shoot from the side and not be a frontliner, right? So what would happen a lot of times when it was Tracer v. Tracer Meadows is both Tracers would kind of go for the same, you know, instance, and then they would, you know, cancel out, right? And they would kind of have a skirmish here, and then they'd either, one would win, one would lose, they'd break apart, get some healing, they'd go for a different thing, right? Oh, this way, oh, they end up having another fight. Tracer 1v1s are very common. What Sableby did was he knew that he could win the Tracer 1v1 more often than not. He was very confident in his Tracer 1v1. And he was probably, might still be, haven't seen him in a while, um, might still be best 1v1 Tracer in the game. Um, he just knew how to play that matchup. He knew how to be Tracer. Uh, and there's a lot of different ways you can play Tracer. And, you know, being that 1v1-er is definitely a way, but it's very, very difficult to master. And Sabio B really mastered it well, um, which is why, like, when he talks about like meleeing a lot, it's something that he does specifically for that matchup because it knows it helps him, right? It makes the enemy, uh, you know, the enemy player uncomfortable. It gives him an extra thirty damage. Um, it allows him to blink in and out. You know, he lots of stuff. So what he would do as a destroyer is he was really confident in his one v one ability, and if there was an enemy team who had a very very strong play, tracer player, let's say, you know, London. Right, and you have profit on tracer. Yeah. So profit, super strong tracer, right? Obviously Jonax is super good Zen. But even if Jonax is super good Zen, Tracer is still a pain in the ass. Right? And if you have to protect your Zen and have to use resources to protect him, it can open up opportunities for the enemy team on the front line. So if we're in a situation, right, where we have, let, let me just pull these out, right, because I have these on the side. I can use these on the side, yeah? So let's just go with, let's go with the standard dive here. Um, that was classic standard dive. You had the Zen, you had the Morsi, the Wonton, you had the Deaver. And again, I'm not going to find this match um, right now. I, I should have just done this while I was fucking dumb. Let's get that mirror match going. Diva. Trace. Again. Alright, perfecto. Right? So, let's just get that fucking shit out of here, son. Alright, so say both of these teams are, are, are sitting up here on this, uh, you know, elephant, right? And your Zens are kind of sitting a little far back. Your Genjis are poking a little bit. Your Mercies are with your Zens. And the Tracers are the free roamers, right? They're kind of doing whatever they want. If the red tracer comes around this way and Zen's positioned like this, 
And the blue tracer is off trying to get, you know, he's maybe doing like some side damage this way. Maybe the Winston's over here and Diva's over here, right? Kind of, kind of that. Tracer has that straight away onto the Zen, and what's going to happen is because of this, the Mercy is going to be forced to be with the Zen, and potentially if the Zen gets low enough, right, the Diva is going to want to come back. What that's going to do is that means no healing here. Zen has to be focused. Diva is going to be away. That kind of opens this front line with the Genji as well for a more you know succinct, uh, a clean dive from these three, right? Because these three are going to dive in, and then even the Tracer can back up and try to get some damage in that way. All because she's kind of exerting pressure on the Zenyatta here. And that's a very strong Tracer can do that, even with a, against a Zen as strong as Jonak. So, looking at this, what Sabio B will do is he will take the Tracer 1v1 in such a way that he simultaneously denies the Tracer's ability to do any damage and to get value. And allows him to get in the fight. So let's say blue is New York and red is London, right? London in the example is just because that's the one I'm thinking of. I remember the game. I'd have to find it. I believe it's stage one, but who the fuck knows? I don't remember. I don't have it saved right now. I should have pulled it up, but I kind of... I'm on a tangent, yeah? So let's say we're here. We're here. We've got the Zens here, right? And we're almost mirror matching it. What Sabio B will do is he'll take this zone here. Right, and if the tracer is coming for a one v one or trying to get himself in a position to come and flank around, what he'll do is he'll take that one v one in such a way like this. Say tracer's coming up this way, he's gonna flank this way. He'll go and he'll take this one v one right here. This is where he wants to take the one v one. He's con he's gonna control this zone right here. He's not gonna let the tracer pass this midline, right? And he's going to basically only engage in these 1v1s when he sees them. Because what he can do is he's going to kill the Tracer, and then it's a 5v6. Or he's going to fight the Tracer, force um, resources out of this Tracer, right? Force her to use recall or whatever. And then if he's forced the Tracer to use recall, and he hasn't yet, right? So Because that, that can be a win for him. He can go, and he can ignore the Tracer now and commit in here knowing the tracer has no resources and doesn't have an ability to commit on a zen making it essentially a 5v6 so where the tracer is going to be the one having power to come in and put pressure on zen what savio b is doing here is he is preventing that tracer from getting the value that she wants to get by commanding this whole space and destroying the tracer it's basically the exact same thing as a soccer analogy where Sabio b is looking to shadow this tracer to make him his number one target and minimize the impact he's going to have on the game because especially in new york's case if he can minimize the impact of the tracer that maximizes zen's impact and when you're looking at a zen as good as jonak that maximum impact is crazy good all right so doing that automatically gives their team an advantage even without any kills coming through. So this fight right here, with Sabio be taking this 1v1 in such a way that the Tracer is split from the rest of his team, but Sabio B can easily retreat into his team or go towards the front line and finish off any low health tanks, right? Gives more value to Sabio B in the 1v1 than this Tracer in the 1v1. So they're both taking the same 1v1, but Sabio B has more value. And if he wins that Tracer duel, 6v5. Because he won't do the thing that this Tracer wants to do, which is go put pressure on the Zen. He was not that kind of assassin, you know, um, Tracer player. Uh, but a lot of other Tracers are. That's kind of where they find their value is gunning for these supports and setting up a dive. But if he prevents this Tracer from setting up a dive, he maximizes the value Zen has, maximizes his own value, and minimizes the Tracer's value. So he's destroyed her, essentially. He shadows her. And he's becoming the destroyer. So Sabio B is kind of the king, uh, in, in my head at least, um, of the destroyer. He really does that role well. Let's see if I can... Let's see if I can find it. I remember it being on Nepal. I remember pulling this up. No. This is Junker Town. This is... This is... Uh... This is Numbanai. No, definitely not that one. Now. 
Maybe they do that here. Is this goats? Ew! Guys, it's goats. Goats is illegal. Yeah, no, this was this is different. This is not proper meta. Oh, maybe it's this. Looks like it might be the right meta. It's a, oh, this is Pine. This is Pine's intro. Mm -hmm. Let me say, actually, this fight might show it really well. Yeah, it's over there. I'm sorry. I'm kind of being a weirdo. Okay, no, it's not this one. I'm not sure where it is. Um, it was, you know, it was, if you can find it, it was London versus New York on Nepal, on Shrine. And I cannot find it. Um, but if you can, glory be to you. But I, I, I got nothing. But that's kind of essentially the, the concept of the Destroyer. Um... I have to make, I want to make a video on it, like, a, you know, put it on YouTube. I just have to be more, it, it, less long-winded with the explanation. I'm not really sure how to kind of bring it about. Um, the Muma thing, perfect example of that being, you know, a team strategy, a specific pick. Uh, this being a character and play style of, you know, with Sabiel B being that tracer. Um... Are there any questions uh, on that? Any questions on anything else uh, in the discussion about? It could be about anything. It's a discussion. It could be about coaching. It could be about not coaching. Or as long as it's Overwatch. Well, it doesn't have to be. As long as it's not fucking weird. Um, Looks like it's not boot. That means we are in time for the VOD review. Now, as I said before, we are doing Fusion versus Rain from the Overwatch League from this past week. What map are we going to do? That's the question. So let's exit without saving here. Oh, I didn't mean to do that we're gonna pull this up what don't look at my hentai nobody look at that can i fucking scroll that over here thank you fucking sorry i didn't mean to exit like that i thought i meant to exit to main menu okay i'm gonna fucking sign in don't spill all right excuse me Says I'm already connected. I know I'm connected. I'm fucking obviously connected. Maybe this one. Let me log in. There we go. Okay, that was weird. El Bizarro. Okay. Now we're into it. The time has come. We have five glorious maps to choose from. Actually, four because I'm not going to be doing Elios. Let's think what we have. We have Dorado. So we have Dorado, we have Nepal. Mm. Spicy. We have King's Row. And we have Volskaya. So I don't generally like Dorado. Nepal, King's Row, King's Row. I'm going to pick King's Row. I like King's Row. Nothing you say is going to stop me. Alright. 
Winnable. All right. Yep. Mickey. Thanks. All right. So let's get into the VOD review now. VOD review time. Time. Let's look. Rain versus Fusion. This was a banger of a match. Uh, plenty, plenty of good moments. Um, plenty of good moments. Plenty of fun. Lots of interesting compositions. Not really. There's a lot of goats. All right. So what are we doing first? Okay, so first things first, I think this is very important. Um, when we're looking at the compositions between the two teams, it's getting right into it. It's how we always start. We start with the comps. King's Row, uh, it has, you know, it, we all know what the meta is right now. It's very goats heavy. Now there is other stuff coming through. Hammond with three DPS. There's been quad DPS. Uh, mm, there's been... Not really a lot else besides that. There's been a little bit of dive, like Winston Standard Dive. You've been adding the Sombra in. You've been putting Sombra in instead of the Diva, right? But traditionally, this is a GOATS map. Now, a lot of teams on the defense, so if we just look at the way these two teams are, is GOATS on this map tends to get run with the Reinhardt, no matter what, attack or defense. Because the way this map works looks and is you can very easily by going through here let's pull this up here and let's get on kings where's kings oh shit it didn't even make me name it all right pog you oh it's because it's it's just the viewer okay that's fine um i don't necessarily need the the the, the heroes um if I do, I'll do it later. So if we look, the point is right here. Yeah. And what ghosts can do is even if things are on like high ground and stuff, uh, they do have an ingress through a hotel to get to the point. And then if they just want to go and hold point, it's very difficult for a team to dislodge them off the point. Right? So goats has a lot of point potential, period. And this point just gives them a lot of value because your only two high ground options are really here, here. This isn't necessarily a good one. Or one here and one here. Now the only way you can really play goats against or against goats that isn't goats is to play some sort of double DPS that has high burst and has strong ult potential. Uh, and when you do that, you need something that's going to be able to contest point like a diva. So there's very specific comps that can counter goats on this, but goats is really really good at sustaining on the point. Now there is another version of goats that doesn't have the Reinhardt. It's called floats. Floats is or dive goats is just goats with a Winston instead of a Reinhardt, and all that does is that you know gives you a better control of the high ground. And when you're looking at these two teams, you have Pokpo on main tank and you have Sado on main tank. And if you were watching this series at all, you already saw it. But Pokpo is a much better Reinhardt and Sado is a much better Winston. So even on maps where you would generally see teams just go goats to goats, Philly would choose floats. Uh, it happened against London. They did floats on defense on Rialto. Um, you know, they would do a floats defense on... The best one, the best example is uh, Philly would do a floats defense on Volskaya, while Atlanta Reign would do a goats defense on Volskaya. Same point, same concept, different main tank. And they do play a little bit differently, uh, specifically in the goats to goats matchup, because what's happening... Let me pull this up here. Is say we're going goats to goats, right? When you're going Zen goats to Zen goats, the idea is if this is your Reinhardt and this is the enemy team's Reinhardt, whoever gets the Discord on the Reinhardt first and forces the Zarya bubble out, which takes the Discord away from the Reinhardt, is going to have the advantage in the fight because it's all about resource management when it comes to goats. And Zarya bubble is a hugely important resource. So if you can force that bubble to come out and then engage right put the orb back on you're going to do a lot of damage to the rhine and once that rhine falls we talked about the cleave damage earlier cleave damage is not going to be available for the other team it's only going to be available for you they do have the brig but that's not nearly as much cleave damage as reinhardt and you can't get things like shatters off of it uh, he has fire strikes strong shatters he has pin he's a lot more instant kill potential and damage potential than a brig does like ever so once their Rhine goes down, your team has the advantage, and that's kind of the way you play Rhine Goats is you're going shield to shield. Winston Goats is a little bit different, where if you have the blob of goats here, like say this is just six characters, one, two, three, four, five, six, right? Or actually, just five. Usually Zens 
will sit a little further back. And this is actually something I've been thinking about in regards to New York and one of the reasons I think they'll be even stronger at this stage. But that comes for later and I might be making a YouTube video about that. So don't ask me questions on it. Or do. I don't really care. Um, <laughs> one of the things that floats will do is because you don't have that Reinhardt, you can't go straight into them because their Reinhardt will pump damage into you. What Winston is trying to do in this situation is use high ground that he has, right? Say this is a little bit of high ground. He wants to jump in and then split their Zen, split their back line, and either kill the Zen or force attention from this five back onto him, which allows these five to do damage into their back. So they're splitting their attention of the goats, and he'll get Azaria bubble on the way in. He'll put his own bubble down. He'll make it very difficult to die when he engages like that if done properly. And Sato is a much better Winston, so that's kind of a filly you're going for. So, yeah, you see Pope. Puck post switch immediately. He's not as comfortable on the Winston. Um, I'm not sure how this first fight plays out, though. So that's what you're going to be looking for here, right? You're going to be seeing Atlanta go to the point, and you're going to really, you're going to want to watch Sato up here. He's going to be attempting to do his best to split Kodak off, or at the very least, when he engages, to go for an engage on the. Is that why you should discord the Zen when running the Winston Goats? I mean, yeah. Pretty much. Like, Winston Goat's target isn't the same. Like, you put it on the Reinhardt, fine. But when you have something that's diving like Sato, you're going to want to put it on whatever the dive target is, especially in a comp like Goat's where there's just so much damage, right? Like, putting it on the Rhine doesn't have the same value. What, what putting it on the Rhine does, it's not actually... I mean, it is to kill him faster. But what you're doing with that Discord is you're forcing damage. You're going to force the Zarya bubble, and you're going to force the Brig heal pack. And then you become, like, you know, they talk about alt management a lot. You know, who has the better alt economy or whatever. But just as important is the cooldown economy. So if this team used Zarya bubble and your Brig armor pack, and this team had a Rhine but didn't, this team over here has the advantage. Because then they can steamroll in, and their Rhine can just swing for free. Because he's going to get the bubble later, so he gets the value more. And he's going to have a break armor pack, so he can sustain more. And then this Rhine is going to be forced to swing back to do any sort of, you know, damage to the enemy Rhine to force him to back off. Which, when his shield goes down, it's going to allow the Discord up onto him, and then you kind of go in from there. But, when you're running Winston Goats and you don't have that ability to just run forward into them, uh, you can't really get the same value of shocking the Rhine. What you can do is you can, you know, put as much damage in as you can to force the bubble out of the Zarya from the Reinhardt. Like, if you're on the high ground here, like, Volskaya is a better example of it because just the way the point is situated. But if they're, you know, you're here and they go this way, if you can just shock the Rhine enough and then kind of soft engage onto him, right, where you jump down but you don't necessarily use your cooldowns, force a bubble, and you can jump out and then go after the Zen when the bubble's down. But yes, the Reinhardt does the Discord on the Reinhardt doesn't have the same value. Yeah, this is what Sato's doing here, right? He's just poking, he's trying to pull resources. Because they're all up on the high ground, they don't necessarily need to be using resources on the low ground here, right? They don't have to commit. Uh, they can stay up and they can they know that you know EQO and Boombox are gonna keep whomever is contesting the point alive for a long enough time, whether it be Poco or Sato. Uh, so Sato is really just here to kind of put a little bit of damage, get a little bit of alt charge, maybe if he can force a cooldown out. Something. Anything that's going to give him an advantage. He just gets out, gets armor pack. So now they don't have armor pack, which means it's going to be harder for them to contest. Poco moves to the side, right? He knows he can't hard contest. Yep. And there, there's a dive. Boom. That's a big... That's something that Boombox have been doing. Um, this is... One of the most important, I mean, every, the thing about goats, which makes goats kind of cool, as much as it sucks ass to watch a lot, and I'm actually enjoying the Overwatch League goats, I, I don't think it's too bad to watch, is every character is important, but Zens are huge. The teams that have Zens that do this, that do what Boombox just did, and get that first pick onto, like, Kodak here, I don't even know where Kodak is to get picked off there. Um... Where the fuck is he? Is he just in the hole? Where the hell is Kodak? There's the friend, dude. I did not see him. Hold on, I need to 
I need to keep my eyes out here for Kodak. Okay, so that's Lucio. So Kodak's far, 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 far back. He's not with the team. Okay, Blue Box is here. So the only place Kodak can be is over here. He's just positioned very poorly. What the fuck? Daco, stop fucking moving. That's Massa. Brig. I have no idea where Kodak is on this death. He gets discorded clearly. Oh, he's right there. Oh, that's huge. Yeah, so this is this is exactly what Floats is looking to do. Uh, as the engage comes through, right, you can see the tanks moving forward, trying to take this space. And Poco's almost trying to lure them in, saying, you know, come get me, open up your back line. And honestly, Boombox hits a mad right click on him, does so much damage. And the second that damage comes through, this is what Floats is doing, is they jump in and a bubble comes down immediately, which allows Winston to have more uptime in the back line. And once he has that uptime, he's just going to cleave in. He'll stay long enough. He'll have his own bubble to be able to jump out. But once that kill goes down on the Kodak, that's all hands on deck, right? You're going to see everybody dive in here. You have Sato's in, and they all start to come in uh, on the aggression. EQO jumped down, going after Pukpo. Easy kills. This was really, really clean uh, from Philly. That was one of the cleaner fights you could ask for. And that's one of the things that... If you're watching, and I'm actually, I'm actually gonna show show this to you. Uh, if you're Overwatch League, if you are trying to run goats as a team, there's one thing that you need to master, and it's punish. You need to punish mistakes or forced errors. That is how successful teams run goats, and you're gonna be able to see this. And I want, I want you to notice this. I want anybody watching to see this because this is massive. And you're going to watch this. When you're watching Overwatch League, if you watch this week, and they're playing GOATS, look for this. This is what you want to look for, right? Uh, no, not that. <laughs> Don't look for Dogman getting rocked. Um, nope, Dogman getting rocked again. He does that. Where is the one that I'm looking for? Nope. Omega lull. Nope. Nope. Is that it? Where is this? It's on one of the Philly defenses. I'll find it for you guys. Don't you don't you fret. Okay, it must be on this defense. Yeah, it's on this defense. Alright. So this is this is what I want you guys to, to be able to do. If you're running goats, this is what you do. So I'll kind of go play by play here. Daco's spinning his fucking head around so he doesn't die. Alright, so this is floats, which means high ground. Oh, this actually happens way, way, way quicker. Okay, so this is big. So one of the things, there's a difference between what teams can do. There can be teams that are good at punishing mistakes, teams that are good at causing mistakes, and teams that are both. One of the things that teams need to learn to do is you need to learn how to force errors out. A forced error is anything that was... You, based on your the abilities you used, the shots you took, the rotations you made, forced an error out of the enemy team, and then you went on to punish it. So we're at 925, so let's remember that. Uh, best example I have of a forced error here is... Uh, where is it? This is the second defense. This is the first defense. I have it here. Was it on the attack? Was it on the Philly attack? I'm sorry, I'm kind of bouncing in and out here. This is a little different than... Hmm...
No, it's not here. I'm being a memer, guys. I'm sorry. Is it right here? It's right here. Okay, here it is. Perfect, perfect. It was a lot earlier than I thought. Okay, so this is uh, what we call a forced error. So uh, Atlanta's on the defense here, right? So their def their defense is set up typically. Very typically, you're playing Ryan Goats, you play on the point. There's no reason to take high ground. You want to be on the point. Philly, what they do is they rotate all the way this far side, all the way around here. What this doing is it's going to force uh, the Atlanta Rain to rotate, basically. And instead of facing this way, since Philly maneuvered this way, Atlanta has to face this way. The supports then have to pivot from being back here, swinging all the way around to being back here, still behind the tanks, right? As they do that, and now Zen, this is a... This is a... So this is Dogman attempting to get himself in a solid position as Zenyatta. So the tanks are all here. He's trying to be in a position where he's not very easy to dive. You know, he he can't he can get value with discords and get value with everything else, right? And this rotation is what causes the take from Philly. So they are very patient. They rotated, right? Dogman's putting himself in this corner. They keep going. They keep rotating. They keep moving. Now they start to kind of press forward, right? They're put, putting on the point, putting pressure on the gas. What this does here is everybody starts to go forward, right? Sato pushed in this way, and I believe there was an armor pack on to Pokpo. There was something on the Pokpo. There's a bubble. I thought I saw an armor pack. I could be wrong. Bubble. Yeah, I think I just saw an armor pack there. Bubble and armor pack. So two really big peel options for uh, Atlanta are down right now. So they come this way. Right to try to contest Sato. Sato goes this way. Now these guys don't have very good mobility. Sato does. Dogman is still positioned back here based on the rotation, and because Atlanta moved up this way, but Dogman's still trying to keep himself protected. Sato, with his jump over here, sees him isolated and gets a free jump in that way. So right here, boom, right there. Sato jumps in the back. Right there. Sato jumps in the back, takes them down. Dogman dies almost immediately. There's no bubble, no nothing. And we see four of the members of Atlanta aren't even close to their supports. Absolutely isolated, perfectly played. A great example of a forced error. Okay, Google Chrome help. Google Chrome, please help. So there's that. All right, so let's continue. So that's what a forced and an unforced error is. Any questions? Again, if there's any questions, please let me know. So Philly don't really mind taking the, uh, you know, taking that tick. It's okay as long as they don't lose the point. They played that pretty perfectly. So let's see what Atlanta does. So do they go through hotel? They do not. They do not. Do or not. They are just poking, waiting. Now they go through hotel. So generally when you see that, what they're waiting for is they're waiting for cooldowns to come back online. You know, Azario may have used bubble to get energy. A Brig might have used armor pack. They want these cooldowns to come online. And the reason that they're coming through this way, as opposed to the main entrance, is ooh, Sato is going to be positioned blah, 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 right here. Thank you. Sato is going to be positioned up on one of these high grounds, right? He's not generally going to be positioned in here because his value isn't as great up on these two. He's really, really good here. He's got a better view of all of the point. He can jump to here. He can jump to here. He can jump to here. If Sato was positioned here, he wouldn't have gotten that jump onto uh, Kodak to get that first kill. He wouldn't have been able to. He wouldn't have had the rage, especially here. No sight lines. Here has sight lines through the entire point. So he controls more of the space of the point from both of these high grounds. That's where his biggest value is going to lie. And these spaces give him the most options to jump down and contest without using his Winston Leap, which means he can use it to escape later. So it gives him just a lot more options in his main tanking. Right? He can survive longer, do more things. Now, what Atlanta's doing is instead of coming up this way, what coming up this way does, it's going to offer their backline up in one of these two spots 
for basically to be picked off because they're moving this direction. If the backline was over here, backline's getting no value because they're already on the point and they would have to do a long rotation to get in sight line of their backline again. So the backline has no value. So you're making your, you're putting yourself in a five v six scenario. But if they come in this way, doo -doo 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 -doo, they can rotate and they can put their support in the corner. And this is going to be very, very difficult for Sato, who's positioned up here, to rotate all the way and get to without using his leap. And if he uses his leap and they punish properly, they're going to get a kill off of Sato. So that's why going through a hotel is kind of the play, because they're trying to keep their supports safe. Because the Discord onto the Winston plus the stun, that's what's going to chain, you know, chain reaction that kill. So you see, right? Oh, they needed their mech back. That's why they took so long. So you see they're pushing, and Kodak, you could see him. He was already all the way back there. And we can see Philly is already just starting to rotate up here where they can get damage down, and then someone's going to be able to jump the back line. And I believe Sato is still up over that way. He's going to rotate. Most likely he's either already all the way over there or he's staying further back because he wants to be on a more separated sight line. He doesn't need to shield. Oh, uh, yeah, he's over there still. So he's waiting. He wants them to come and push towards the point because if they push this way onto the point, that opens the back line up more. And you can even see Poco and Neptuno are lying in wait. So what this is doing is this is causing basically the team to look in different directions. Uh, this is what people talk about when this goes crossfire. This is what Double Sniper was really good at. One of the problems that I saw people who ran Double Sniper had, especially at low elos, was actually say we can use this point for example. This point works great for double sniper. You can basically, if a team's running this way, you can have a sniper set here and a sniper set here. And what's happening is they're covering different sight lines. So say this is Widow, say this is a Hanzo. Hanzo covers the whole point plus the back alley. Sorry. Whoops. So this is the whole Hanzo sight line right here. Widow has all this area, this, and this. So she covers the rest. And if a Ryan is on point here, right? You have the Hanzo up here and the Widow up here. His shield cannot point in both directions at once. He has to pick. Picking forces, you know, or allows, rather, the other sniper to get value. So if he points that way, Widow gets value. He points that way, Hanzo gets value. That's the danger of double sniper. A lot of the times I saw people running, they would just run the two snipers on the same sight line. And that means that the Ryan shield is going to get double the value because he can block everything through one site rather than being forced being forced to make a decision over which one is the bigger threat at the time and the mobility of the double sniper really made it scary because you could have you know hanzo over here but then he could rotate this way and widow could rotate this way and then hanzo could move this way and if you had hanzo here and you had widow over here then the sight lines are already different and you have a lot of different rotations op options that way this floats is operating under the same principle with floats, a lot of people make the mistake that because you have a Winston, that means you can hard dive. You cannot. You can't just hard commit. Motherfucker. You can't just hard commit back here because they have cooldowns, they have bubbles, they have barriers. You know, the Zen's in a safe spot. What you need to do is you need to create these crossfires. What this doing, right, you're going to have Carpe building up his bomb. You're going to, you know, have Boombox doing a ton of damage, getting Discords on for free. And then you have Poco coming this way who has a free, you know, contest onto the point. And then, so Neptuno can put him onto the point and then Neptuno can leave whenever he wants. And Poco can as well. And then Sato is hoping to get a cut onto Kodak again. So let's see where this goes. So bada bam bam bam. Hard dive. I think a little bit too aggro. That's one of the mistakes that I think Sato made early in this series was he would hard dive too aggressively. And that's what happens when the timing's not perfect is you see he needs the bubble like now because he's already discorded because any good Zen worth their salt is going to be keeping that orb on. But he gets hit by, I believe, oh, that's a good boop from Daco. I didn't even see that. Daco just slam dunks him. Boom, that's nice. That's good diva play right there. Daco alone prevents Sato from being able... To, I thought that was a whip shot. Um, it was not a whip shot. I thought that was a whip shot from uh, Erster. He basically single-handedly prevents Sato from coming into the back line and splitting them. 
forcing the fight in a more favorable way for Pokpo, who wants it to be all in front of him rather than some in front and some behind. So that was a really good one. And the thing is, I believe Philly kind of expects they either come do they come down? They come down as Sato lands, so they're coming in to protect Sato, and basically they know they have to take this fight now. Since he committed his jump in and bubble was already used, that means they have to come down and they have to contest this space, or else they'll speed into Sato for free and get a kill, and he's not quite at primal yet, so he cannot survive that. It was a little too aggressive on the dive here, and then, yeah, so the issues here, this is what happens when you hard commit. So... Like I said before, Pokepo wants to be have everything in front of him. That's what the Ryan Goats does. And you have... And this is a good example of punishing the mistakes, right? You see the speed boost come in. Because Sato's here. Neptuno's here. Um, Poco's here. I believe that's Nep that's Boombox. Boombox is there. Everybody's going to try to speed out this way because they're in an unfavorable matchup. And these guys don't even worry about Boombox. Is Boombox possibly a more valuable kill? Yes, but they can ensure by going this way, Sato jumped out, they're just all going to steamroll, train roll into this and kill EQO, and I believe they kill Carpe as well. EQO, oh no, I'm sorry, that was Neptuno. Boombox with the late trance. This was something that Boombox was having problems with uh, this whole match, was late trances. He had some really clutch openers, but his, his trances were on the late side. And now, theoretically, this should go Atlanta's way. It does not. Uh, so let's see why it doesn't. All right. So let's see. Oh, because Sato pops the fuck off and Defran blows his grab. So this was really, really calm from Philly and not very calm from... Yeah, okay. All right. So let's go back to this. So let's kind of break this down a little bit. Wow, this is taking a while. All right, blah, 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 So this is like, I would say that this is really, what the, stop it. That trance was probably the least calm part of this fight. It's kind of a panic trance. No reason to use it. Atlanta should win this fight because, in theory, and I, this is just Defran with a little bit of a throw moment here, in theory, Without the trance, when it comes to goats, grav is not used in the same way grav is used to just throw and then kill everything that's in it with just raw damage. Because of the trance and the fact that you have sound barrier, you need a big boom to kill everything. That's the grav bomb combo. And that goes at 86, and this is just a huge waste. Well, one, normally you need that grav bomb combo. And when you're in Winston Goats, it's a lot easier to get killed by the Grav Bomb combo because you don't have your Ryan Shield. Winston Shield can be broken very easily, and if you don't have it on cooldown, you're free to the Grav Bomb. But even in this scenario, the Trance isn't there, so you don't even need the Bomb. So what should happen is they should play Point, wait for them to come in, and then grab, or then just grab, knowing they don't have trance, and that Neptuno died, so he most likely doesn't have sound barrier, get a free wipe off of that, using Poke Po's swing to finish up and shore up the damage, or if they really want to, they can grab bomb, but Defran kind of throws this one, trance is out late, really bad decision, doesn't get any value out of it, all it does is stall the point, now, Philly, the reason that they can do this is because they also have that same combo, and we'll go into that a little bit, how they get this done quicker, because normally, you'll see it later on, you'll see when you do a Rhine v. Rhine Grav Bomb combo, when the Rhine is caught in the Grav, the other Rhine, in this case of who will be Sato, has to charge through to bring the shield down, because stun doesn't go shoot three shields anymore, and Zarya bubbles will prevent the stun, so Zarya's will keep their bubble to protect their Rhine from being stunned, so the Grav Bomb dot combo doesn't come through, so you need to charge. But you'll see one of the ways that you can get that out uh, uh, when you're doing Winston Goats. Because it's still a viable co uh, combo, but you just do it differently. So whoop. so let's see how this goes. So Carpe and Pogo are playing safe. They know that they have time. They only got one tick, and there's plenty of time for Neptuno and Ikkyo to get back, knowing Neptuno has that speed boost. So they're just playing safe. 
Sato goes in. This is just, again, he's contesting here. Uh, he, I believe, where does he primal? He primals off to the side, keeps himself alive. He most likely, I can't see. Have to see here. I want to see where he's going. Okay, so he hard commits. He jumps onto Kodak. That's his hard commit. Kodak actually gets, I believe, uh, rally armor or just an armor pack. But Sato hard commits on Kodak uh, to try to, you know, follow up on the kill here. And he does. He is successful in that kill, which is huge. That means Trance is not available for when they come back in. Defran doing this is a huge mistake because you can easily burn down an ulting Winston uh, with goats if you stun it. And Sato dies anyway. So a really, really huge waste of grav. Same on the front of Pogpo. This is kind of where you see them not being stressed, but just not having the experience. Because there's no reason to throw that Shatter in. And they wasted their two biggest fight winning abilities. Grav and Shatter win fights in goats. There's not that many win conditions because it's very hard to kill things without a combo. Besides, you know, um, swinging as a Reinhardt. And it's even harder in floats because that main tank is not directly in front of you. But Pogpo wastes it. Defran wastes it. Huge waste of a fight from Atlanta. Having that alt economy, they absolutely could have won that if they saved that shatter and saved that graph. Sato goes in. Beautiful. Gets the bubble. Forces out the beat. Now, he dies for it. But the trade in the ults is a good one because that allows a free grav this way from, who has the grav? Carpe. And then a grav bomb can come through. Now, why, oh, this, yeah, so this is what you're looking at here. This is how it gets done. So normally in this situation, right, Ryan's grab, you have all these guys grab. Zarya's going to have bubble saved for the Reinhardt so his shield stays up and they don't get killed by the grab bomb combo. If Sato was Reinhardt and was alive, what he would do is as the bomb's exploding, he would charge Pokepo out of it because charge goes through bubble. And that would take the shield down and then the combo goes through. We'll see that again later. But since he's on Winston, that is an un that's not an available option. So what you have instead is EQO pops the rally, gives himself a little extra speed. And Neptuno could do this as well, speed him in. I believe he does. Yeah, he hits the speed boost. Bomb comes through. He's waiting in the back. All he's doing is waiting to stun him poke poke. He wants to stun him to, from the back to take the shield down. Because if he turns, the bomb will kill him anyway. Unless he has that shield. So Ikkyo goes around the back. This is what he wants to do. And if Pogpo turns, Carpe is going to burn him down. Because they don't have the trance yet. Because Kodak isn't back. And they already used beat and beat's done. So he can't turn. Bubble goes on to Defran. But I do not believe he had a projected... Oh, he projected on the brig. Eh, not the smartest idea. But he tries to go for the stun. Doesn't follow through. Daco gets a bomb, which is why he was unable to eat it. And then it swings back into Philly's favor. So Philly with really good patience here to not just jump on the point because they were losing it, but knowing that they have the economy and the abilities to win the fight. And then Sato goes back on Reinhardt. Um, I'm not really sure why. I think he was having better luck on Winston. Uh, I don't like this switch. I really think the Winston could be good. Now, one of the reasons that I could see is this is something that I tell my teams is when you're running on 2CP, for example, alt economy, especially against Goats. Goats is a steamroll composition. It's a composition that steamrolls the enemy team. And if you're not going Goats to Goats, it's very, very difficult to swap to Goats and then come back in the alt economy. Because goats just build alt and they can cycle them. You can do shatter. Okay, great. Then you can do grab bomb. Great. You have a shatter again. Great. Then another grab bomb. Great. And you just go and go and go and go and go. And if you don't build the ultimates up to counter that, you're going to have no way of getting back into the fight. So once goat starts rolling, it's very, very difficult to stop. And what, what that means is it's going to be, you know, very hard for like what I was talking about with 2CP is that say you're running Hanamura and you run like a bunker comp, you have an Orisa comp, but the other team runs goats. Even if you hold them for a minute and a half, they're building ultimates. And they're going to have ultimates. And if they take the point, you know you're going to have to switch because your Orisa comp isn't going to work on second. 
but they have the ultimates. They don't have to switch. So they just roll into you and you have no alts to counter it. And Goats is so extremely hard to get a single pick that can turn the fight. It just doesn't happen. Ever. Unless you hit like a widow shot and, you, and you, you're more relying on the enemy team making a mistake than you doing something good. So because of that alt economy disadvantage, you never really want to in 2CP. It's why you see goats being run, even if it's not the most optimal, because you'll never be behind in the alt economy. You'll always have a fighting chance. Even if you lose first, you're not going to get steamrolled on second. And I believe this is the reason Sato is going because he knows he wants to switch off of Reinhardt. He knows that they used a lot of resources in the last fight. He knows it's going to be very difficult to win this fight. And it's very, very hard to hold first on Kings. So he'd much rather start building the ultimates on the Reinhardt knowing that he's not going to be on Winston. And so let's see how this gets done. So I'm not sure why Boombox fell there. Potentially because he has Trance. Knowing he, he almost has Trance means that he wants to be as close to his team as possible when the Trance hits. Split, and now it's just an alt fight. Atlanta stays a lot tighter in the core. Yeah, Sato gets wrecked. And there's another Trance, comes out a little too late. Was that a stun on the Sato? Yeah, stun on the Sato. Sato goes in without a bubble to swing. So he goes to swing here. Um, I believe, when did the bubble get used? So there's Carpe's bubble. And there's an armor pack. Oh, uh, see, I believe in this situation. Let's look at it. Right here, EQO passes in front of Sato. Carpe wanted to bubble Sato here because Sato's about to start swinging. He doesn't. Atlanta notices this mistake. Hits the stun, Pokpo big shatter, game over. There's no combo for a Poco to use. He's not quite at alt yet. It was very close, but there was no way for him to do it. And the mass amount of healing uh, coming from Atlanta was going to make it very, very difficult. Still a scrappy fight, but really scrappy. That's just split all the hell. It's just at this point, trading one for one is more beneficial for the attackers than the defenders. And they just take it off of, you know, pure respawns alone. But it was very close. All right. So moving into next. Moving into next. So we have three minutes left, and it's going to be goats, baby. Woo! <laughs> so, yep, three on cart. Polkbo kind of pushing up, pushing up to take as much space as they can. Yep, there's the bubbles coming out. Trance in. They do this trance knowing that Carpe doesn't have bomb or grav. They know they can engage heavily with the trance and not worry about it. They also know Masa has a beat. If it was me, if it was my team, I would have hoped for beat first on this engage because knowing Carpe, he builds his grab so quickly that the grab's going to come out. Now, again, you're expecting the grab bomb combo, but you still want that trance because if they don't use that combo, your trance nullifies the ultimate. It's still useful to use. So I would have preferred Masa to use his beat there if you're planning on using a support alt. Now, the only argument is you might say Kodak builds it faster, but they're still gonna get wiped pretty hard with the Graviton. So Philly is fine losing this fight. They take it early, they take it quick. All that does is, you know, they force the Grav out. Now they don't have Grav Bomb combo coming out of Atlanta. So they're not really afraid of that. They're really only afraid of the Shatter. They know that they have grab bomb combo coming in, I believe. P Pogo didn't use his... He did when did he use his bomb. Big mistakey awakey. But we still know they don't have trance. They know that they're better in the alt economy at this point. They're almost up to six ultimates. So this is good from Pogpo. He's taking space. 
He doesn't just sit on the cart. Because you don't... You don't want to just sit on the cart when you're Reinhardt. You want to take as much space as possible and force them to fight you uh, on your own favorable conditions. Now he's going to start to back up and start using the corner, but notice that cart got up to him. And he didn't push in a way that would allow the cart um, that he wouldn't be fighting when the cart's with him. So maximizes how far the cart's going to get. But Philly does well to lose the fight early enough that they still get a second fight. Now we can see here, Bubbles coming into Poke po. I can see Armor coming on the Poke po. This is him wanting to go in for a big shatter. Boom, right there. Went for it. Really, really well done to read that. The speed in this way, right? They see the bubble. Was that? Oh, is that a god tier play? That may be a god tier play. Maybe, hold on, I want to This could be good. This could be good, guys. So he's walking forward. Bubble. Speed in. He knows he wants to speed. Bomb comes in this way. I can't tell. I can't tell if that's him just walking backwards. I think Poco boops him a little bit. It makes it hard for him to land that shatter. Sato wasn't having any of it regardless. Um, anyway, all that they were doing here is... So Shatter Bomb is, is a combo, but it's very unoptimal. Very hard to pull off. Uh, teams know that it's coming. They use bubbles to prevent it. But this was a good idea, right? Daco throws his bomb... <coughs> in behind and what you're looking to do is you're looking to force Sato to turn to block the bomb and then get a shatter on him from behind doesn't work Sato understands it Neptuno puts the the beat in here try to protect everyone not let the bomb get that finish on them and then they can go in off of a speed this way now this is you're going to see exactly in this fight how um Grab bombs work. He got grab bombs so fucking quick off of that. So it was really well done from Philly to you know alleviate the pressure. They go back. All right, and this is kind of how goats support alts can work when there's nothing in play that's going to prevent them from working. Right? This beat Masa wants to use to keep them in the fight here. Not sure if I necessarily like it, but what it's going to do is it's going to force ultimates out of Philly. And they can hope to build ults for the next fight. Atlanta's really not in a good position here because they use these ults. DeFran's not even close to ult, and they have no support ult. So Atlanta's in a really bad position, coming into what's essentially going to be the last fight after this. The last one or two fights. Whereas Philly is killer on the alt economy. The Tono is using this, knows they're nowhere close. They use Grav. And they know they're nowhere close to Shatter, so he's free to use this. This is going to allow the team to go in. And this is also forcing Masa to use this or wipe cleanly. And then again, it's even harder for them to come back into the fight. So they come through. One of the things I like that Atlanta's doing here is they're pushing back. And this is something that uh, we I've been telling my team a lot when you're playing GOATS and you're pushing backwards. Is you want to use the cart as much as possible. Right, if you're backing off like this, because in goats, what this does is creates a narrow passageway, and it's very awkward for the Rhine to get in. So you can kind of create your own little choke using the payload. And if the Rhine decides to go up, you would get like a free shatter, a free stun. You can boop them off with your own hammer. Uh, you just make it very difficult and force them to use cooldowns to come and get to you through that choke. Whereas at the end of it, you're kind of more free. So that's kind of just a little thing that, you know, teams can do. Uh, but I believe, where is the DM usage? Because that's important. So DM is right here. Uh, I believe he's taking, I don't know why he's DMing here. I'm not really sure uh, whether he's expecting the grab out of Carpy or not. But once that DM goes down and that goes up in the air, free grab. Carpe knows it. DM with the two second cooldown. The second you see that DM go down... It's game. One of the things that Ryan's will do 
uh, is they'll throw their fire strike. And I don't know if this was a, a situation here. I don't believe so because he was still mecking. Yeah, no, it wasn't. Um, one of the things that Ryan's will do is they'll throw fire strikes to bait out the DM because a lot of uh, divas want to eat it. And once that DM is down, free grab. So the grab comes through, Poker gets the bomb, and this is what we're talking about here. Everybody's stuck in the grab. Four man grab. Sato hits the charge. Oh no, this is a different bomb. I'm sorry. I'm dumb. <laughs> dumb, dumb, dumb. This is just a very well placed grab bomb. They have no trance to counter it, so they can just swing it for free. They honestly didn't even use the bomb. But it's not necessarily a bad thing because with this, just all that's going to do is going to keep Carpe and Poco on the same page. Uh, when it comes to ultimates, because Sato can get a shatter to win the next fight, and then they'll have it coming in the next fight. So huge alt economy, alt advantage coming from Philly. This is a really great spot to stop the payload coming on Kings, because realistically, it takes a very long time for the attackers to come over here. Defenders are a lot closer, and you know, they have this kind of right here, this corner to use in order to kind of back off you know, and protect the payload. They can fight in front of the payload a little bit and then create that chokehold corridor here. Poco can be a high ground here or here. Boombox has like freedom back here and back here. This is a great place to hold. This is, you know, a very tough spot to be stopped at, especially with very minimal alt economy like uh, Atlanta has. Oh, pog. So they're coming in, coming in. Now, I believe Poco's just setting himself here to attempt to kind of eat the grav, uh, knowing or wondering if Fran has grav, because what you want to do when you're D.Va, and it's something it, they talked about in Overwatch League on, I believe, a watch point, but when you're D.Va, uh, you want to set up in such a way that you're at an off angle to eat the grav, because if your DM covers like this, this is more area. So say DeFran's here about to throw his grav. This is a lot more area than if you were right here eating here like or eating like this that is less area for him to go because it's as opposed to this is what the defense matrix looks from the front this is what it looks like from the side so it's more area covered on the graph eat so if you're over here and he wanted to throw it here 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 you have it covered if you are here and you wanted to throw it here, 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 here. You only have it covered in, in a very small angle unless you're directly on top of them. So Poco being here just means he he's looking for an off angle to, you know, get some damage and try to eat. And you can see that he DMs immediately as they come in. So he DMs right here. He's DMing the frame right now, thinking he may have grav. It's a little bit of a risky play because they may have called, you know, whomever is tracking ultimates may have called that DeFran has the grab. It's a bit risky because now that DeFran does have the grab, they don't have the DM to eat it. Now, that being said, Daco used his bomb for the shatter combo. He does not have it. Trance should keep everybody up alive. Yep, there it is. Trance keeps everyone alive. Big shatter to counter. Really well done shatter from Sato. Uh, good shatter reversal. Uh, one of the things, slight thing, fun thing, when you're Reinhardt, if you're stuck in a grav, and you're going against that grav bomb combo. So say this is a grav, and you're Ryan, you're stuck in your grav. And Diva's coming in, throwing her bomb, and she throws it down towards the ground, right, like this way, so it's gliding across the ground. Hit your shatter. Hit the bomb and stop it dead in its tracks and then hold your shield up. Because what Divas are trying to do is they're trying to put it in the middle so it's very hard for you to shield everything. But if you stop it here, you get a clean shield from the front. Hitting that fat shatter, reversal shatter is a, is a big, um, is a good idea. You just make sure that their Ryan doesn't have shield up. Because a lot what, what a lot of Divas will want to do is throw it over top. The over top ensures that it doesn't get shattered. The down low uh is a risk to try to get it through to the middle so there's benefits and deficits to both so good counter shadow from Sato. that wasn't what he was aiming for basically he was just preventing anybody from building any ultimates in the graph that shatter one it won them the fight but two it prevented any buildup of ultimates from anybody uh like defran kodak esther anybody who got shattered they can't build up ultimates right now they're not doing damage to build up ultimates. Kodak's going to get it by virtue of just existing. But 
Esther didn't get his ult. Defran can't build up his grab again. Daco can't build up his bomb. Things like that. Masa can't build up sound barrier. It's preventing ultimates from coming through. So if Hooker really wants that DMX, it's not going to happen. So you come through, take kind of an aggressive fight here. All they're doing is kind of, I believe all they're doing here really is trying to bait out cooldowns. Uh, trying to make this a harder fight for Atlanta to take. Knowing that they almost have that grab bomb combo. And this is this is where I wanted to show it. Big sh Was that another shatter? My man is sick with it. Builds up another shatter so fucking quick. That's huge. How does he get that through? What? Puckbo, you gotta keep your fucking... Wait. Puckbo didn't get shattered. My man, you gotta stay in front of your opposite Reinhardt. God damn. Well, that was a perfect shatter again. Because what that does is it prevents Daco from using DM. Free grab bomb. And here, this is where it is. So they use Sound Barrier to keep them up alive. They have Trance active. Grab bomb goes into the air. No chance of getting shattered on the reversal. Sh uh, I believe they actually tried to. Popo tried to reverse shatter here. Right there. Tries to prevent Sato from being able to charge. Shadow Sato knows it. Holds that shield up. Carpe knows it. Shield Sato. And as this comes in, he's shielding, he's shielding, he's waiting. Perfect charge into the Rhine. Ryan's gone. No shield. Three dead. Brilliant play. And then from there, it's just clean up. Brilliant, brilliant play. Uh, Carpe was not the MVP of this uh, set. It was Sato. By a wide margin. Okay, so... Wow, okay. Oh, that was the... That was the yeah, see, watch here. So he goes, he waits, he waits, he waits, he waits, he waits, he charges, no chance, <laughs> huge. All right, so very short time for Phillies. So let's see what we got. So Phillies running standard goats. Floats is very difficult to run on the offense here because you cannot get your supports up to the high ground. So they are not safe from a speed in or from a counter floats. They're not safe, therefore you really can't do it. If you wanted to do it, it'd be a very, very long rotation. You can get punished for it. The only way is you would have to either rotate all the way down here or potentially you could rotate up here and use speed boost to jump. But at that point, you're wasting a good 30 seconds on just cooldowns alone. It's not worth it. For, for not very much value because you're not they're not pressured to be on the point. You are. Until you get on the point, the defense isn't pressured. So the defense can just sit in the corner and not show their zen. They won't care until you jump on the point. So it's going to take a lot of time to set that up for very, for, for not very guaranteed results. Not going to run the floats on this, even though it's very strong on defense here, because Pokepo is a much better Reinhardt. So let's see how this fight goes. So we're rotating, look, boombox, he's pivoting, he's keeping himself safe. He wants to do as much damage as he can without putting himself in a bad position. So just being patient here, pulling out cooldowns. There's no deep engage right now. Bubble comes in, New Neptuno with a huge play. Where does this 1v1 happen? Oh, Master's just off to the side. That was a shot from boombox too. That's the only way he goes down that quick. There's nothing else that's going to do that much damage to him. Ping right there. That was a shot from Boombox. Boombox pumps him in the head. Easy kill off of Massa. There's the go button. They even, even before that, they bubble Sato knowing he wants to engage. Right here is where the engage wants to happen. They go and bubble gets broken immediately, but they don't care. Without the speed boost, this Goats is sitting ducks. They can just pump damage into Sato, keep him healed up. And then isolate. Here's a great isolation. This is another example of a force mistake, right? So Massa gets killed. Great stuff from Boombox. Keeping the Discord on him to try to get that damage in there, right? Knowing Pokepo has a shield, there's no way to get that Discord on him. Puts it on Massa, who's bouncing around. He hits that one shot. Neptuno finishes it out. They have no way to get out for free. They can just speed in with Neptuno. 
So they go in, they're putting pressure, right? They're not hard committing because they don't have resources back yet. They don't have bubble. You can see EQO doesn't have armor pack. He doesn't have shield bash. They're not ready to go in yet. But once they're ready to go in, three people over on this left side here, they know they see them. Fuck them. Who cares? Because Pokepo and I believe it's Kodak going ham. Damn, how long has this VOD been going? Not long. We're almost done. Uh, Pokpo and Kodak split themselves this way. So instead of retreating as a team, as a unit, they go this way. It's just a free kill. Goats is going to come in and ram through him this way. Speed boost in. Kodak dead. Esther dead. And then from there, there's only three people left on the point. Boombox gets killed by Defran, but doesn't do anything. No delaying of the inevitable. Very clean fight from Philly. Uh... Boombox doing what Boombox does best, which is getting that opening pick in the fight. His trances were have were very off on this this, but I really respect that ability to get that first pick. So what they want to do here is they know that they really only have two fights. They only have either one loss and and then the rest winning. But they have two places to take this fight. You can either, exactly like what Philly did, you can either take a fight early, and then one more here, or you can take a fight in the middle. Now, you'd rather give yourself the second option, or the first option, over the second option, even if you're unprepared for the first option. You'd rather take the fight here, because this ensures, at minimum, you have a second fight, and here you can build up some ultimates, right? If you just fight here and you don't win, and Philly just took the point off you so they have better alt economy, you lose. You're not getting back to that point. So they have to take it early, and they have to take it even earlier than Philly did right at this spot. They have to take it here because they need, they can't let the cart get as far. They have to have the cart stutter right here. That's where they're ending, so they need to take it really early so they can make sure they get to this corner before the cart passes it to get, one, good positioning plus high ground, and two, obviously don't lose the fucking match. That's really important. So they take it early. They want this fight early. They want to use archway. They want to use the, the corners of the archway to maximize their fight. And Philly's cool with taking this early. They have alt advantage. Now, there's still some ultimates on the side of Atlanta. Uh, supports, even on lost fights, tend to get a lot of ultimates quickly just because of the nature of goats. You're getting a lot. There's healing a lot of damage. Do you feel about aggressive first fight is a good idea? Or more of a slow, drawn-out fight to bait out ultimates. In this case? Like right here, this first fight on second? Um, that's a really tough one. Because looking at what you have... Why don't I... Why don't I take take the, the low road and, and go with both? I'm going to say you want an aggressive fight to bait out ultimates. Uh, I, w I would say you want to, as best as you can, take a really aggressive fight. Like, you can even use Rally here in this fight. Make it slow a little bit. Use Rally and, you know, try your best, obviously, not to uh, get shattered by, by Sato. But if you use Rally and then come in with Pokepo and attempt to get a Shatter, you can probably pull out one of these support ults. And that'll give Daco time to, to get his bomb up. And then you can go with the grab bomb combo that way on your next fight and your next engage. Like, having that combo win condition is huge, but Daco's not even close right now. Uh, I would probably take an aggressive fight. I don't think a slow fight would really work well here because I think Philly are going to be better in the poke. Uh, Boombox is just going to be better at nailing those shots and pressuring down the shield. And they're not really, they don't really have the same stress. They have five minutes. So, like, you do a slow drawn out fight, Philly might not ever use ults. But you're afraid to lose the fight, so you're going to be forced to. Philly might just wait for six. I would take the aggressive fight. Yeah, I, I would do I would do what Atlanta is attempting to do here, which is take this aggressive fight. They're not doing it well, but they're trying. Oh, they nailed it. Never mind. <laughs> I'm wrong. But yeah, see, I think that's the best option there. Take that aggressive fight. 
Because you really, what did you use? You used, the problem is you used the grav, though. That's a big issue. But at minimum, you took that fight, you forced Boombox to use Trance off of the grav, you still have Shatter, you still have Bomb, and Sato used, Sato used his Shatter. So you did, just feel like Atlanta has a massive advantage on this choke compared to Philly. Yeah, they can, but I think Philly just has the overall advantage of time. Like, they have time. It's like, I think that aggressive fight there allows you to... Basically, because what's going to happen is if you take that slow and drawn out, then Poco and Carpe are going to get their stuff, and you could potentially lose the fight off of, you know, a, a rally, this, uh, maybe even a beat, uh, and you're going to be forced to use your own alts to, to not do that. And then they're going to use their ults. Or you can just take it aggressive and not even let them build their ults and get an even extra, extra fight. I think you get like three there as opposed to two or four as opposed to three. So I li like I like this aggressive positioning here. Yeah, Poco, you fucking go, Genji. Like, see right there, like how, how close was he to bomb? Like, I mean, that already shows, that shows the uncaringness like poco is is poco in mech right now yeah poco's in mech right now like he has bomb and he still switches but he doesn't care about it he knows he'll build it up again he doesn't care they have time And Kodak just used trance, so Carby's just gonna go for this grab here. Ooh, Taco gets split again. Taco keeps splitting himself. Or, not Taco, I'm sorry, Pokpo keeps splitting himself. Yeah, I, I think that this is kind of the problem with taking that kind of slower approach. I don't necessarily they think they did take the slow approach here, but like Philly used beat and they got it. They still have grab bomb. They have one good alt combo, which they just made you lose with, by the way. And that's it. So the, the problem with the slow approach is that Phil, you know Philly's going to take it to you. Everything. It, it, but that's the problem. That's, that, that was the problem is they're not executing the combo. They, they, they wasted it. Defran used his grab here. Uh, let's go back here. So, like, this is so weird. All right, so we use we use this to keep Poco alive. Awesome. Keep him up. Engage off of it. All right, cool. Boombox is using trance, right? He uses trance as a counter. When does he hit trance? He just hit trance. Why does Defran use this here? Like, he, he, I don't think he needs to. I don't think he needs to use that there. You have Rally. You have Puckbo Shatter. And, it, you know, it pulls out the Zen Trance, but now you're stuck with the bomb that's not going to get any value. So where is it? I mean, where is where's Daco gonna put it? Where is Daco gonna put it? And then like poke poke will whiffs another shatter. It's just stress. I, I mean, Atlanta's feeling the heat uh, in this map, and then Pogba gets himself split. The Fran gets himself killed. It's like, that doesn't need to be... Neither of those ults need to be used there. So, this slow game wasn't the way for Atlanta to play. They needed to take it to Philly. Like they needed to really take it to him. Because you could tell when they played slow, they got stressed. They didn't play right. They played slow. Because they try to... That's, that's what they try to do here. They try to eat this pressure. Right? They try to go in. Alright, Philly's got a lot of pressure. Okay, let's back up. Let's eat that pressure. And let's try to reversal it. Okay, the beat comes in. Crap, that's a lot of pressure. Uh, we don't have we don't have beat yet. All right, let's get beat. Fuck. 
Uh, they're coming in. What do I do to get beat? Oh, fuck, I'll shatter. It doesn't work because Sato's not stupid. He keeps his shield up. Okay, uh, crap. My two tanks are fucking dying on me. What do I do? I throw my bomb in the air for no value because there's still bubbles out. There's still a brig shield. There's still a Rhine shield. Like, so instead of did not work for Atlanta. I would have just taken him to Philly. Taking that pressure, I would have just gone in. And now po Poker's going to build it up. They're not going to commit to this fight. they got three and a half minutes. Oh, uh, or they just C9. For fear of a grab? Oh, that's really bad. That's worse than the bomb. Masa, what are you doing? Watch Masa. He's on the cart, and then he's not on the cart. Even though they're in trance. Masa, why throw? Oh, that's a huge throw. That's a little bad there. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much it. I forgot it ended on a C9, to be honest. But overall... That was pretty good, I guess. Um, I guess. <laughs> this is a good map. Good to discuss goats and floats and everything like that. Um, so I think that'll do it for me. Short one today. Uh, is there any questions? Final questions. There weren't a lot of questions today. That's okay, though. Kind of hanging out. C9 light. No, that was a C9 heavy. Uh, no, nothing light about that shit, son. That was straight up pure C9 edge. What was that? Charlie Niner in its, its most pure form. But are there any questions before I kind of go? Um, as. Light? No. As as always, uh, my Twitch is in the top. If you haven't followed, I would appreciate it. Uh, play a lot of comp. Probably going to be doing more Overwatch, the Overwatch League stuff as the league comes through. <laughs> um, as the league keeps going and trying to find time to it. I'm kind of busy on the night times. But hopefully I can find some time to get more of these in because these are kind of fun for me. Especially if more comps come out. More of those like Hammond, the Triple DPS, Quad DPS. Dissecting those will be a lot of fun. So doing those. So if you want to follow, you can. Feel free. If not, I'm here next week. Most likely unless something comes up. And again, if you have any questions, um, I think we're good now. But if you have any questions, you can always DM me. You can find me in, in Outlet in the Discord. Um and all that so you can just shoot me a dm and i'll answer any questions but uh kind of a chill night tonight nothing crazy but i appreciate uh everybody coming in so thank you and uh good night